It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there, but how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? Fortune Cribs can help. Fortune Cribs helps investors buy short-term rentals in select markets around the country for as little as 10% down with cash on cash returns in the 20 to 30% range. Fortune Cribs will design, furnish, and manage all the day-to-day -day operations, making your experience truly hands-off. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your real estate investing journey, whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your portfolio, Fortune Cribs can help. So if you want to take the next step, go to fortunecribs.com and book your free consultation to see how Fortune Cribs can best help you. Once again, that's fortunecribs.com. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Melanie McDaniel. And today we are the two smart assets. For those yet not yet familiar with Melanie, she is the founder of Freestyle Capital Group, a boutique private equity firm, and Freestyle Fund, a customizable fund. She partners with passive investors to invest in private equity real estate transactions across a variety of asset classes, operators, geographies, and investment strategies. Melanie offers a Michelin star experience with a curated investment opportunities and aims to have a personal relationship with each and every investor. Melanie, it's so great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to speak with you today. I've been waiting for this. Uh, I'm, I'm a little too hyped probably, but uh, you know, we like to keep the show off by hearing more about you, the guest, Melanie. So tell us more about your background. We know you got a great story. Dive into that and then tell us you know, the path you took to be so successful in your real estate investing space. Yeah, well, it, I'm a late bloomer for sure. So in 2015, oh, well, Backing up, I grew up in regular town, Utah, right? Kind of the suburbs of Salt Lake City. Went to school, got great grades, right? Had all these great ideas. I want to be a doctor and stuff. My dad's like, are you sure you want to do all that school? I'm like, do I not want to do all that school? So I ended up not, and I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I joined the military right out of, I didn't even finish high school. I graduated in my 11th grade year and left for the Navy at 17. Uh, and I chose the Navy because it was the one that would let me travel the most, right? So my first duty station was in Italy. So check in the box, did well <laughs> on my pick, did my four years. And as I was getting out, I was like, well, now what? I, I knew I wanted to go to school, right? Because that's what I was taught to do. Get sure. Go to school, get good grades, get a job, go to college, whatever, all that stuff. So that's what I was doing. I needed to go to school and I didn't know what I wanted to study. And so I just started making a list of things that I liked the most. And the first thing I wrote down was travel. And I literally, that was the end of my list. I'm like, okay, I'm going to study that. Like, why not? <laughs> Tourism and hospitality happens to be a degree. So I went to Colorado and got my bachelor's in travel administration. So that was um, college. And then my first job out of college, I was uh, I bartended my way through college. And then I moved to Hawaii again, travel, right? I wow. moved everywhere. And I was a deckhand on a submarine off Waikiki. If you know Atlanta submarines, that's what I did. And I was doing that job and I was miserable, one, because the corporate ladder didn't seem too promising. And I mean, claiming, claiming up people's vomit just really doesn't, <laughs> it's not that much fun. <laughs> so um, my uh, dad's wife at the time, well, they're still married, but, and she still is a park ranger. Anyway, she was a park ranger. Uh, when I was in college, I'd gone to visit them a lot. They were in Rocky Mountain National Park, but um, I'm like, well, I can do that, right? I had my military experience, kind of a foot in the door with the family, nepotism stuff going on, right? So <laughs> got into the park service, decided it was easy enough. I, I went to law enforcement academy and ended up getting a job. I ended up doing park rangery stuff for nine years, Wow! but I never loved it. When I was a child, if you asked me, Melanie, what do we to be when you grow up? It was either doctor or I don't know, but I, and I didn't really know what I wanted to be, except I didn't want to be a cop. That was always the thing I didn't want to be. And then I ended up a freaking cop. <laughs> I'm a cop at that. Like not even a cool cop, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Park rangers are great. Love those guys. <laughs> they hated what I would, when I would, my coworkers would hate what I would say. We are such nerds, guys. We're nerds. <laughs> We're park rangers. And they got mad. Anyway, whatever. Uh... Obviously, I didn't belong in that line of work. Um, then I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2015 and everything changed because I'm, I'm a relatively smart person, I think. You know, grades were easy. I'm mostly you can figure stuff out. Not really great at trivia. 
who has time for that. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, how did I not understand this concept of the trading time for money and working for yourself, owning a business? Invest- I had no idea on the investment and business ownership side. No idea that that was actually good. So um, real estate seemed to be the answer. I did the Rich Dad Poor Dad training program. I pulled chocks. I quit my job and moved across the country, became a real estate agent as the stepping stone to the the full investor world, which I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be bigger than an agent. Being an agent, owning rentals, single family rentals, I knew I wanted more doors, more uh, economies of scale because I'd spent many, many hours on on patrol while working, getting paid to listening to bigger pockets. I mean, I was on patrol. I was still looking around, right? <laughs> listening to bigger pockets, hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours. And I felt like I had a real good education by the time I became an agent, but I didn't know what that ending point was. So sure. became the agent, ended up doing Michael Blanc's coaching program for the apartments because I had through research and whatever decided that was the best best way. Did all the effort to get my first 24 unit, realized I hated most of the jobs to buy an apartment. Mm. So I'm like, oh, now what am I going to do? Because if I want to buy apartments and I hate doing it, what am I going to do? So in 2019, I went to Dealmaker Live, which is Michael Blanc's conference. I don't remember who it was or what happened, but somebody speaking said something about being more on the capital side, raising the capital. And I thought, oh, I love talking to people. I really believe in real estate. I want to be picky about what investments I do. Why don't I do that? So that's what I did. Set off in 2020. I launched Freestyle Capital Group from Thailand because by that time I was fully nomadic. I had left the real estate agent world and had a nice long runway. I could work from a computer. That is also why the just doing the capital side was appealing to me because I could do that anywhere in the world because I am a, a Zoom. Like I knew Zoom, worked with Zoom long before anybody did. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-COVID Zoomer. <laughs> I'm an OG. That's awesome. Uh, So I knew that I could do that, launch that. And honestly, the first year and a half was tough of the the capital raising because I was trying to find co-GP opportunities. And if you go to a big operator and you say, hey, I want to raise capital, I want to be on your team. And then say, well, how much money can you raise? I'm like, well, I don't know. I've never done it before. Right. (laughs) What makes me think they're going to pick me, right? So nobody called. Um, (laughs) And then that winter 2020 winter, I think I, I went to like IIREC virtual and Hunter Thompson gave a presentation on an SPV. And so that started opening my eyes to the fun world. And I did my first SPV, which was much easier to sell than I need a co-GP. No, it's, Hey, if I write you a million dollar check, can I, you know, get some GP share? And they're like, well, of course. So, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not a partner. I'm not, and I'm not doing anything. I just send them money and they're happy, happy to compensate. And then, um, yeah, transition from there and just this journey of learning, which ended up to where I am now with my current customizable fund, which I'm very happy with. Yeah, I love that. And I, we, there's so many topics to dive in there. I do want to ask before we go reverse back a little bit, you know, yeah. so you're, you're in this fun space now, you're doing that. What, what are you thinking about it? You know, you're, you're kind of, you're getting into it. You've raised some money uh, in your opinion. Is this kind of the way you're going to go forward with this? I mean, I know, you know, the realtor thing you got out of that, you got into this investing, there's tasks you didn't like about being a, a syndicator or an active um, investment uh, or investor in that space. But then now you're, you're doing this uh, kind of capital raising thing. Is this something that you obviously you said you liked it, but in terms of of your experience so far is this you think this is the path for you yes as i do it more and more i love the model more and more uh specifically the model i do so with funds there are different kinds of funds uh some people when they think of funds they think of blind funds where they invest with somebody and that somebody or that team they go and buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell within the fund right and it's blind meaning they don't know what they're buying and selling you don't really get to see the numbers on all the deals you just it's kind of like investing in the start, stock market you don't get to see the financials of every company in your what are those things called like EFT or what not EFT what are, NFT <laughs> not NFT <laughs> no like your what your wealth advisor sticks you with oh yeah yeah businesses in it whatever anyway (laughs) i'm not a stock person don't trust me on the stocks um anyway so that's what it is it's blind you don't know what uh what they're investing in you just know kind of what their shopping standards are right what they're going to do and what they're hopefully projecting to get you 
And, but with blind funds, you can usually get out in and out. Uh, it's a little different, like with syndications, as we know, you're in it and you're in it. So it's the same with mine. So customizable means people invest in the fund and the underlying fund. If you put money in my fund, it just sits in cash. You have to go in and have a deal to allocate the funds to. So I could be raising for a value-add multifamily, a storage unit, a triple net lease, an assisted living deal all at the same time. And people can invest in the fund, go into their portal and put, instead of 100K in one deal, they can put 25K in four deals. So they're already diversified in wow. sponsors, geographies, asset classes, or even asset strat- or investment strategies like more cash flow, more upside. Because you have your triple net lease type stuff. You have development, two totally different investment strategies, different risk profiles. So diversification is, is, the, is the reason. And I feel like right now this fund fits our world and where we are right now with all the unknowns. I think we're kind of back to a diversification model, not just stocks. Stocks have always been kind of that, unless you're a stock picker type of person, you normally, you just invest in your 401k and they stick it in a few options, right? Well, now I'm trying to provide that for people in real estate with this curated opportunity, but they can still go in. If they want an appetizer, they can have an appetizer. Maybe they just want two salads. Maybe they want entrees and desserts only. So they get to pick what they do inside of their own. It's one fund. 1K1, but multiple investments inside that they get to pick. That's pretty powerful, you know, and we kind of talked a little bit uh, before the show about diversification and, you know, kind of some of the things that you're saying. Can you can you dive into that a little bit more about why you think that's so important, especially right now in terms of being diversified, even, you know, if even if you stay within just real estate, uh, why, why is that yeah. so important? And I'm, and I'm, of course, just offering real estate opportunities. There is sure. a, something to say for diversifying outside of real estate, like Bitcoin, maybe NFTs, if you understand them, oil and gas, whatever. There's so many fun opportunities. But for real estate, just for the economy, macro economy, um, COVID aftermath, right? So we have printed a bunch of money, which creates inflation, which now the Fed or the Reserve, or Federal Reserve is now you know saying we're raising interest rates. So we have all of that happening at the same time. We have extreme labor shortages. We have extreme supply chain issues. And now we have a war going on. You know, who knows what's going to happen with that? So all of the unknowns just make me want to diversify a bit because, and it was just at best ever conference. And my favorite thing to attend at conferences, I go to a lot of conferences. I think I did nine in 2021. I've already done three this year. And (laughs) it's crazy. I'm crazy, but it's fun. I have a lot of fun and I learn a lot. But uh, three economists and at the end of it, summed up, real estate is still amazing. 2022 and 2023 are looking very good because of supply and demand. There's so much demand and very little supply. Even if it's too expensive, there are still buyers lined up. There's a lot of capital in the space. And if we aren't selling houses to individual families, which is kind of sad, we're selling tracks of build to rent or build to sell properties to hedge funds who then hold it for a very low return, like a you know a very squished cap rate, but they're fine. They get four to 6% return and they're happy. And then they rent it out to our American families. But it is what it is. Like, I don't know if people have a hard time with raising rents. Well, I'm sorry, wood prices went up, gas, like everything is up. We have to raise rents to pay for the buildings that we are providing. And we're all in this circle cycle together. So And another thing that was the takeaway is the land of milk and honey is multifamily and industrial. They're both poised the best because they have the lowest uh, vacancy rates of all of the asset classes. I was going to ask about that, kind of what your main focus was for this year. So it's going to be multifamily and industrial? Always multifamily. I think it's not going to go out of style to have a roof over your head. And then industrial shine during COVID, really shined. And with our future of being an online marketplace... One of the economists said um, for retail, there's a lot of upside in retail, but not grocery store anchored retail because grocery stores are going to go the way of retail, of mm. Kmart, because we're going to shop online. Sure. Our food is going to be delivered to us. And it, it, I mean, it kind of blows my mind. I mean, this is coming from an economist, not me. It's not my idea. So industrial, cold storage, look at your transportation sort of, you know, but like trains and trucks and ports, like those are going to be places to watch for investing in. But yeah, triple net leases where you just own the building and lease it back out to some large corporation, industry, whatever. I I don't think you can go wrong. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. Uh, I love those asset classes as well. I think last year I focused on 
um, multifamily and self storage, just as a passive investor, just getting in deals like that. And I kind of kick myself for not getting into any industrial deals. So that's a that's a goal of mine this year is to to get into at least one industrial deal on a on the passive side, right? And so I, I love your fund. I love that because you know I, I'm investing fifty thousand dollars a pop in a single deal, right? And that's one asset class, whether it be self storage. Uh, mobile home parks, you know, apartments, whatever. But you know, you have this fund where really you can take that fifty grand or hundred grand or whatever it is, and you can diversify across all those different things. And you know, you mentioned, uh, and we said this, I think, in your bio as well. It's important that you're not just different asset classes, but you're in different different markets, right? And you have your sponsors that you really like, so it's different sponsors. So I think that it's huge as a passive investor if you're looking to diversification. This sounds like the perfect fund for that. I kind of feel bad. Some of my my favorite sponsors, you know, they, they're experts, like they're Dallas. They're only Dallas. They buy everything in Dallas. They know it inside and out, but those poor guys who have built their whole businesses around Dallas, like they're wondering how they can diversify unless they're just being limited partners. They would have to build businesses and teams and new markets all over. Cause there are a lot of companies that will do, you know, buy assets all over the place. I would definitely look into who's boots on the grounds and ground and all that stuff. Um, but for like an average syndication size company, they can't afford to have assets across the country all over the place. So they're kind of like, man, we want to diversify, but we're so locked <laughs> into this market. I'm kind of feel bad for them. Like, well, you can invest with me. <laughs> I love that. I love it. It's, it's a it's a unique tool you have built there. And I think it's, it's going to be really powerful. So I'm glad you you shared that with us. I know our listeners will be loving to, to look into that. I do want to back up a little bit. So you know, you, when you first got into this space for, for capital raising, and you found out about SPVs and stuff like that, you said, you said for I think it was the first year, year and a half, maybe kind of, it's kind of slow going there for a little bit, you know, and, uh, and, and then now you've, you've transitioned and you're, you're placing capital uh, with sponsors and connecting with passive investors. And I'm kind of curious, you know, what, what changed in that time period, that year and a half or whatever, was it, was it the investor mindset? Because maybe we just came out of COVID or, you know, what in your experience of talking to passive investors, did you find a a common theme among them um, during that time? So it wasn't the investors. I could not provide them a deal. That was Mm. part of it. So I launched my business February of 2020. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say I lost six months to COVID. And what my newsletter said every month was, I hope you're okay. I'm sitting on the sidelines to see what's shaking on this thing. Because there is no way I could advise somebody that they should invest in anything at that time. Especially multifamily. It turned out to be okay. But it sure seemed like it was going to be at risk with the moratoriums. And honestly, a lot of multifamily, not a lot of people talk about it. But there has been a lot of loss in states that had really strict moratoriums, but really bad programs to like backfill the money that's promised. I will tell you my Virginia property, the government owes us tens of thousands of dollars. So we are floating that because we can't evict our, let's see, our tenants. I guess we'll just call them that. Like just go away, right? Why why us? (laughs) So anyway, it hasn't been all butterflies and rainbows for everybody because of COVID and we're still dealing with it. So anyway, During that six months, I didn't see anybody really buying. There are a few operators out there buying. I didn't know what to tell investors. So it was really just, I hope you're okay, sitting on the sidelines. So by July, I started seeing some of my operators that I really wanted to work with, I trusted, I saw them start to buy. So that's what kind of got me back in the game. But it took me forever. Well, it was from July to December, January, whenever I like learned about the SPV to, um, realize that operators don't just want to bring you onto their GP to help them raise capital. What? Who wouldn't want to work with me? Come on. (laughs) But I don't know how much money I could raise. So why would they take a chance on me? At the time I had my, I had my three operators picked out. I have 10 phone calls with them all the time. I just kept reminding them I was there pinging them all the time. Like, yeah, Melanie, yeah, Melanie. And when it came time to do a deal, I'm like, Hey guys, you haven't called yet. Like you call me. (laughs) So you're doing a deal. Oh God. Then, so I realized, okay, first of all, I don't need three eggs in my basket. I need 300 eggs in my basket, right? And then I started getting deals by like fall, December, or fall or winter time. And I didn't like the deals. Mm. I was invited to raise, but I would look at the underwriting, look at the market, and I would be like, oh, no. No, I really liked you, but no. <laughs> no. <laughs> like the underwriting just, just didn't pass the sniff test for me. Mm. So um, it took me a full year after, we'll say those... Wow. Six months I lost in COVID, a full year to find a deal that was worthy of my investors. 
that I mean, by then I figured out how to do the SPV. Yeah, but that's that's amazing though. You took the, I mean, you took it upon yourself. I mean, this is a real thing, right? You're taking investors' money, you're placing it in deals. You didn't find a deal that that passed the test, right? So you're not going to move forward. I love hearing that. You know, that's the most important thing uh, in terms of you know that business. So I love hearing that. And obviously, you've 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 turned a corner, right? You're you're placing capital in deals. You've created this fund. It's huge, right? And I, I think it's amazing for passive investors to to take this and realize that you know a good sponsor, a good capital uh, placement agent, or somebody like you, right? Somebody who's providing these deals knows how to vet a sponsor, knows how to vet a deal, underwrite a deal, right? Because that's the most important part, right? And so as a passive investor, know who you're dealing with, know what they've been through and know what they're doing to to find the good deals. So I think that that's huge, especially as the past special like myself. Right. And so I think that's, that's great. And I appreciate you sharing that. I do want to kind of go for full, full circle on something. So, uh, you know, travel has been a huge, basically underlying thesis of your life, right? And and you, being location independent, traveling, you've been everywhere. Um, but now working as you know, as you do, um, you basically can work anywhere. Is that is that right? I mean, you could be anywhere and do your job. I mean, in theory, essentially, yes. This year, though, I've gotten sticky in Austin because I love the Austin market. I've made a huge um, network of. I don't even know who my friends are and who my like coworker, not coworker, but comrades are in the space, right? I, I don't know the difference. I don't know if I'm having drinks, happy hour. I don't know if I'm just living life or I'm working. I don't know. Gotcha. And I love that. So I'm sticky in Austin like a post-it note. You know, I'm sticky, but there aren't a lot of roots yet. Sure. <laughs> so I could always peel off and, and run. But this year I plan on having a breakthrough year in my business, my fitness, my health. Just it's it's my year. I turned 40 back December 8th. So my year started December 8th. So it's the year of 40 that I am, I have just really big goals. And when you're traveling, yes, you can do business and whatever, but when you're moving every month and I'm talking moving to different countries, like there right. is a certain amount of momentum that you lose and it's very disruptive to flow and momentum. So I knew I needed to get a little bit sticky this year to really launch my business and take my life to the next level, really. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing because you have traveled, but you realize like, hey, I'm going to do this now and focus on your business. But the one thing I do have a question, you know, as a passive investor, we know it's really powerful. At least I know it is, right? Being able to passively invest because I'm not trading my time for money, right? My money is just doing what it does in this investment. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, you talk to a lot of passive investors. They know you personally. They know you like to travel. They know you've set up this location independent kind of lifestyle. That's just kind of who you are. Uh, do, do you have any of your past investors kind of approach you with the question and say, hey, Melanie, I want to live like you. I want to travel and be, you know, location independent and do that. Do you do you have passive investors approach you with that question? Oh, sure. Passive investors, active investors, people that barely know me. In fact, one of my friends, she's like, Melanie, you're my spirit animal. <laughs> I don't even mean. <laughs> All the time, people, I don't, I'm not trying to portray this like lavish. When I travel, sometimes I'm in some pretty cheap stuff places. Sure. I've been in hostel hotels, not hostels. I don't do the whole sharing the bedroom thing, but the hotel itself might be or co-working spaces or there's so many programs outside of the US for nomads. I, in fact, when I was in Thailand, the reason I was in Thailand in 2020, I was at a nomad summit, right? Really? Wow. <laughs> I was in Chiang Mai, and that's like a nomad capital of the world, Portugal, Playa del Carmen. I would say those three are kind of the biggest. Yeah, of course. Yes. Everybody wants to be financially free because financially free or having time freedom, whatever, isn't just about traveling. A lot of people love to travel, but some people just want to hang out with their family. They want to go golfing. It doesn't have to be travel only. It's just a lifestyle choice. And I think that it, a lot of a lot of times when I talk to people, you know, and like a service you're providing, right? You're you're providing you know, risk adjusted, great opportunities for people to place their capital in and get a return on, right? But it's not. It's not only just about getting a return on your money, right? And it's you're, you're basically providing a chance for people to choose how to spend time if they have, if this frees up time for them, how they want, right? And I think that's that's massive. It's it's more of a return on your money than just than just the money. So I think that's it's massive. And I, I love that you bring it up. And I love that you have passive investors talking about that with you. I think that's that's pretty powerful. So uh, Melanie, you know, it's been a great conversation. Before we get out of here, tell us more about your company uh, and anything else you have going on. Yeah, I think we've talked enough about the the company. I mean, a Freestyle Capital Group, sure. which is just the company, a Freestyle Fund, which is the fund. Um, but uh, the resource that I would love people to visit the website, freestylecapitalgroup.com, it's a resource, your guide to financial freedom, which will help you figure out where you are, where you want to go, and then a path to get there, to get on your um, path to financial freedom. 
I just want to clear up what financial freedom means because somebody kind of like put me in my place about this. So define what financial freedom is for you because homeless people are financially free, right? So make sure you know to you, what does that mean? When I, I don't have to work, this work optional is what I would call it. At what point is that for you? And clearly define it and clearly create a path to it. So that little guide, if you download it, will help you lay out that path. Awesome. We're going to make sure to put that in the show notes, Melanie. So uh, anybody can reach out and check that out. I highly recommend all of us just go to the website, Melanie's website. Uh, I love the website itself. A lot of great stuff on there. Go check that out. Melanie, it's great having you on the show today. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, Connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.